Good Wednesday evening to you. Welcome you to our Bible study here at midweek. And uh, glad that uh, you could tune in and study along with us. Uh, we have just started a, a new study. We're in the book of James and working through the, the book of James for a while. We'll uh, not necessarily cover every single verse in the book, but uh, we'll take a pretty good look at it, uh, sort of seeking wisdom, searching for wisdom, uh, but now in the New Testament in the book of James. And we're going to be, after looking at the first verse last week, we're going to look at uh, verses 2 through 4 and, and verse 12 of chapter 1 this week. Um, in, in this lesson, just a little while ago, sent out an email to those on our list that had a handout uh, that can serve as a guide to the study. Uh, when you print it, it looks something like this. If that's a benefit to you, it's available to you if we have your email. Uh, if you'd like to get those and, and we don't have your email, please let us know and we'll add you to the list in some way and, and you can have those as well. So <clears throat> we're studying again from James chapter 1. And you know, the book of James, one thing we mentioned last time was the book of James uh, is considered by a lot of people sort of the Proverbs of the New Testament. And, you know, as you read it, it sounds like Proverbs at times, and we, we refer to Proverbs because we just uh, came through a study where that was one of the books we looked at. Uh, but as you read through the, the, the verses, the chapters of James, you've got these short statements uh, packed with great meaning, which are very proverb-like. And so I thought maybe we would start the study tonight with sort of in that spirit and offer a few proverbs um, to, to think about, and then we'll get into the text of James. Um, they, they go along with our theme for, for tonight, and I think we can benefit from them. So uh, three little tidbits of wisdom, or three proverbs to begin with. First one is this, growing old is inevitable, maturity remains optional. Another way of saying that is the second one, you're only young once, but you can stay immature indefinitely. And then finally, our last proverb, God never wastes a tough time. So keep those in mind as we uh, look at these verses from this letter that James wrote. Let's read uh, three or four verses here in chapter 1. James 1, verse 2. Count it all joy, brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Then, skipping down to verse 12 of that chapter, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Okay, I hope we can see how uh, those sort of, those words sort of chime in with the Proverbs that we offered, uh, the sayings there at the beginning. I call this message uh, the cycle of spiritual life because I think that's sort of what James teaches us here, that there is this process that we all go through in life, uh, especially in spiritual life, that leads us to maturity. Now, we can short-circuit the process. We can stop it. So it's not as if this is an inevitable thing. We can decide we're not going to mature, uh, but we'll still experience some of the parts of this process, but we won't get the benefit at the end. But there is this process, again, this cycle of spiritual life. Maturity is our goal. 
Um, that's where we want to get to in spiritual things. And it isn't something that is bestowed upon us instantly. It is a process. It's a long-term process. And frankly, it's not always fun. Uh, as you read chapter one of James, you, you, you certainly see that he's teaching that. In fact, this process at times can be really, really hard. And, and again, frankly, for some people, it seems like it's always hard. And I don't know why that is for some and others, but even for people like that, there's people that, that seem to have trouble and struggle their entire existence, and yet they mature. They, they allow it to mature them, and that's incredible faith. Uh, but th this process certainly includes, involves trials. And James here in his book guarantees us that we're going to have these things. He assumes it. As you notice, he writes, when you meet trials of various kinds, not if, but when. And not just one trial. He doesn't say, when you have your trial, he says trials, plural, so many of various kinds um, that we experience. And I guess the part that doesn't make sense to us on the surface is the first thing that James says about it here, and that is, count it all joy. But that's probably because we don't understand what joy is, and we need to be reminded of, of what it is. Notice that, that James does not say, be happy when you meet various trials. That's not the word he uses. There is a word for happy in the original language, but this is not what's used. He does not say, be happy when you meet various trials or you have struggles or hardships. He says, count it all joy. There is a huge difference in those two things. Happiness is a fleeting emotion that we experience. We like it. We like to be happy. We prefer to be happy, but it is a fleeting emotion. Joy is a mature decision that we make. Joy is something that comes from God. It's a spiritual blessing that's found in a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, joy is, is something completely different than happiness is. And we need to understand that. Um, and, you know, you know, uh, I've heard people say different times uh, through the years, uh, God just wants me to be happy in maybe justification for something they're doing. God, God wants me to be happy. The truth is that's not true. Um, God wants you to be joyful and he will do things that will make you happy and you can experience happiness, but happiness is fleeting. Joy is consistent and it, it is, it is something that is a part of maturity, which we're talking about big difference. So James says, count it all joy, not happiness when you, um, experience trials. So that's where we, we start. So we might then ask, why would we count it all joy when we meet trials or troubles? And what kind of trials are we talking about? Exactly what is James getting at? Well, throughout this letter, as you read it and study it, James specifies different types of trials that the people he was writing to in the first century were facing. So some of those may be consistent with the kind of things we face. Some of them may be more unique to them. We might have our own unique trials today. But uh, these were Jewish Christians. They were converts from Judaism uh, and now disciples of Jesus. They had been scattered from uh, wherever they lived. Uh, they, they had been persecuted and so in, for instance, the first verse of the chapter, James 1.1, 1, 1, he addresses the letter to the 12 tribes of the dispersion. Um, that is, to, to you 
Jewish Christian believers who have been scattered about because you've been persecuted, all right? That's the setting for the letter. And uh, we need to realize that for in the first century for a Jew to profess faith in Christ, to become a Christian, that guaranteed them problems, serious problems. Um, their fellow Jews, including their family, would likely reject them. Um, they, they would be disowned by, by their loved ones. Um, and it's not just a Jewish thing. I mean, um, there would be plenty of wealthy Gentiles who would reject them as well because they came out of Judaism. They might well, by becoming a Christian, lose their jobs. Um, at times they were forced to leave their homes and so they had to, as a result, move and, and live amongst strangers, maybe in completely new towns and villages and cities. Um, those are all hard things. A lot of those are probably things none of us have ever faced. Those are all trials or things that, that uh, James mentioned, and they were to consider them with joy, he says. Even those very difficult, unhappy things, they were to count all joy. James, in other places in the book, refers to some other trials they were facing. Uh, I'll just I'll make a couple of references to verses here. You can check them out as I do or, or jot them down. So in chapter 2, verse 6, he talks about how those who were reading his letter were being oppressed by the rich. Well, that's something that's happened ever since, you know, uh, in some cases there is an injustice and these poor Christians were being oppressed by rich people. They were being drugged into courts of law by them. We don't know over what issues exactly, but that was an example of persecution. Um, a little bit later in the book, chapter four, verse two, he talks about these unfulfilled desires that they have um, maybe because they're poor, and fights and quarrels that they're experiencing. Uh, also in chapter 4, verse 11, he, he refers to people who are speaking evil against them. And so, you know, there, there are people that are um, slandering uh, these, these believers. Chapter 5, verse 9, he talks about people who were grumbling against them. Maybe we're getting uh, more within the church itself at the time. And, and certain ones were grumbling against them. Chapter 5, verse 13, he mentions suffering in general and, and a little bit later, sickness. And so they were experiencing a lot of the common things that humans experience. So there's lots of possibilities for the kinds of trials he may be counseling them about. And so that's why he says trials of various kinds in chapter 1, verse 2. But why face them with joy? Let's come back to that question. That's really the key question in this. Um, and as we uh, ponder that for a moment, I would ask uh, parents that are, are listening in a question. Uh, if you're a mom or a dad, how would you react? Imagine this situation. It's gonna sound a little silly at first, but you'll, you'll get my drift. In a moment, how would you react if you walked into your living room uh, one day and you found your young children playing with a skunk? Imagine. Uh, there's this book called Lead On. Um, the author's name is John Haggai, I believe. And he tells the story of, of uh, a lady from uh, Maryland, Darlington, Maryland, and she had eight children and she came home one afternoon, believe it or not, from the grocery store and noticed that it's a bit quieter in the house than normal. And she looked in the living room and five of her little darlings were sitting in a circle in the living room. She put down her groceries, she walked over and saw they were playing with five of the cutest skunks you can imagine. Well, 
I can imagine your reaction. I know what my reaction would have been. She was instantly terrified. I mean, she walks in, her, her children are, each have a skunk they're playing with. She begins to scream, run, children, run. And each one of the children did what was natural for them. They grabbed their skunk and ran in five different directions. And her screams, when she saw what she saw, so scared the children that each one sort of violently picked up the skunk and squeezed it as they ran. You can imagine what happened. The point, got to be a point to a story like that, right? It's always too soon to panic. That is part of the lesson from James. It's always too soon to panic. Don't panic. Instead, count it all joy. Um, it doesn't say that you have to like the trial, that you have to like the difficulty, that you have to be happy about it. It says, consider it with joy. Why? Because God can use it to get you where he wants to get you, to get you to your goal, which remember we talked about at the beginning is maturity. So let's talk about this cycle, the cycle of spiritual life. That's where this comes in. Uh, it's outlined here in this text from chapter one. Here's the cycle. All right, there's three parts to it. Number one, you have the trial, the difficult time, the hardship, whatever it might be. And you can uh, insert whatever trial you're thinking about, perhaps experiencing right now. You begin with a trial. The trial leads to endurance. And that leads to maturity. Trial, endurance, maturity. So that's our cycle of spiritual life. Uh, you experience a hard situation. Um, you develop endurance in putting up with it, living through it. And that leads to maturity. Uh, we are never, as believers, offered a pass from suffering in this world. And uh, it's a very immature expectation, frankly. I, I suppose if we're teaching people and trying to encourage people to become believers in Jesus, we would certainly not want to paint a, too rosy a picture. Uh, you become a Christian, all your problems go away. Certainly not the case. In fact, they may increase. They certainly did for Jesus as he went through his life. Uh, we, we, we are not given a pass from suffering in this world. We are just offered really an effective way of dealing with it. We don't have to panic. God has a plan. He's working his way. Um, he is taking us somewhere. Ultimately, of course, to heaven which is something that, that James refers to in that 12th verse of chapter one, remember, that we read. You know, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. You see, ultimately that's the, that's the goal when we, when we come to maturity, we get the crown of life, which is eternity with God. It's, it's heaven, um, that's the ultimate. But first we go through these cycles that develop us. Uh, so trials can be great opportunities, not just terrible obstacles. They are spiritual opportunities. And, uh, you know, we face a tough time. We have to develop endurance to go through it. Now, you can short circuit that and say, no, I'm not going to face it. I'm going to find some way of escaping it. And so people turn to substance abuse, all kinds of things to help them, they think, deal with, with their suffering. And that short circuits this process, this cycle of spiritual life. Uh, and uh, 
you know, that, that cuts off the work of God really in us when, when we do that. But the way it's intended to work is, is we have a tough time. We have to develop endurance to, to, to get through it. This almost sounds like 2020, doesn't it? Have, have you had to endure 2020? Um, might God be doing something with us, preparing us for something? We've sure, certainly had to endure things in, in this year. So we, we develop endurance to get through it. And when we get through it, then when we come out the other side, we grow, we mature. It's, it's God's way. Uh, last week, when we sort of focused on the first verse of chapter one, remember the theme uh, that we, we developed. It was this idea of less talk, more walk. It matters more what you do, really, than what you say. That really carries over here as well to what we're, we're thinking about because tough times, trials, they'll, they'll prove whether or not we really believe what we say, okay? How we deal with difficulties will prove whether we really believe what we have confessed, what we have said as we've come uh, to faith in Christ. Strong faith is easy to seem to have in good times. I mean, it's easy to live on the mountaintop and when, when everything's peace and light and, and that kind of thing, and we're happy, uh, we love those kind of times. But the question is, when we're talking about the goal of maturity, the question is, it's, it's actually a question we sing a lot of times. Uh, I, I imagine you've probably sung this song. If not, you need to, you need to learn it. There's a, there's a question in one of our, our great songs that, that asks, will your anchor hold in the storms of life? That's really um, the question of spiritual maturity. So the main thing I want us to recognize today is that there is this cycle and it, it's a, as we've called it the cycle of spiritual life. God established it, he, he designed it and suffering and trials are just guaranteed to come to us in this world that it's a fallen world. Um, it's you know sometimes poetically called this low land of sin and sorrow. Um, we're going to face difficult times. There will be tough times, but we can face them with joy, not happiness necessarily, but joy because we realize God will use trials to build up our endurance, to build our faith, and in the end, we will grow. Uh, we, will, we will grow in maturity. We'll be built up stronger, perfect and complete. James says, lacking in nothing. Uh, illustration just popped into my head. Uh, recently bought a bike. Okay, I've been wanting a bike for years. Been a long time since I've ridden, other than in a gym, you know, those stationary bikes. But I finally bought a bike because I, <clears throat> I live in a neighborhood that's just great for bike riding. Not, not a lot of traffic and... Um, Good, good place to exercise. So I bought the thing. And one thing in our neighborhood is there are a lot of hills. I haven't been able to ride very far because the first couple of times I, I thought, oh man, I am out of shape. Can I even survive a five minute bike ride? And I've had this one little circle that I've been riding. It's almost like a cycle, you know, a cycle on my cycle. And, uh, I've just been trying to master that one circuit and I've, I've maybe done it four or five times now. And uh, just yesterday I got through that without feeling I was going to drop over, you know, and pass out. And so the endurance is coming and the strength in the legs and so forth is being restored. I haven't done a lot of things like that during this crazy year and been able to go to the gym and things like that. 
but it's just sort of the same kind of thing you see. Uh, you go through difficult time, whether it's riding a bike uphill or, or, or facing a trial in life. Um, it builds us. It, it leads us toward maturity. We can become perfect and complete, as James says. And remember, he says this, blessed is the person who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. That's, that's the promise of scripture. One more little story. Years ago, there was a, a little commuter plane, a little flight from Portland, Maine to Boston. The pilot's name was Henry Dempsey. And you can uh, look him up. It, this was something that, that really happened, not just a preacher story. But the pilot, Henry Dempsey, heard a, a strange noise that he wasn't used to hearing in the back of this very small aircraft. And so he, he turned the, the controls over to his co-pilot and he said, I'm going to go back and check out what that was. It, it concerned him, this, the sound he heard. And so he, he makes his way back to the tail section of the small plane. As he's doing so, the plane hit one of those air pockets had a little turbulence and he was actually thrown against the rear door of the plane. And he quickly discovered the, the cause of this strange noise he had heard. And the cause was that the rear door had not been properly latched prior to takeoff. And as he was thrust into it, it flew open and he was instantly sucked out of the jet. The co-pilot back up in the cockpit saw the red light come on on his instrument panel that indicated open door and he immediately radioed the, the nearest airport and requested permission to make an emergency landing and, and told them uh, that the pilot had apparently fallen out of the airplane and requested that a, a search team be sent to that area of the ocean and look for his body. Well, after the plane landed, um, they found Henry Dempsey. He was holding on to the outdoor ladder of the aircraft. Somehow, as he was being sucked out of the, the aircraft, he had caught a hold of the ladder. Uh, he had held on to that thing for 10 minutes as the plane flew 200 miles an hour at an altitude of 4,000 feet. And then as they landed, he had managed to keep his head from hitting the runway, which was just about a foot away. They said it took airport personnel several minutes to pry Dempsey's fingers from the ladder. By the way, he was alive. He survived. So, you know, things in life may be turbulent. Uh, trials may come. And at times, you may not feel like holding on. But have you considered the alternative? We're exhorted here in the text to hold on, to endure, to grow up, and thus receive the crown of life from God. It's a cycle of spiritual life and something that one degree or the, the other we experience probably every week in, in some way. I encourage you to read through these verses and uh, look forward to meeting with you again next Wednesday. Uh, if the Lord wills, we'll, we'll study the next little section here in the early part of James. God bless you this week as you live these things out and I encourage you to find someone else to share it with. Uh, this, is, this is God's truth that everybody can benefit from. God bless.